Passover the door. We're getting close to Easter. This is appropriate. It's, um, it's uh, well, let me pray first and then I'll, because I, I'll start meandering. It's no telling where I'll stop. So, um, Jesus, thank you. Thank you for your anointing. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your promise that you'll never leave us or forsake us. Thank you that you're constantly abiding. Thank you that you've given us your Holy Spirit and you've made us temples of the Holy Spirit. Oh, Lord. We declare this is your house and we are your people. Have your way here today, Lord. As we look into your word, you speak to us. And we just believe you will. And we pray it in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen, amen. So last week we were in Genesis 43. Genesis 43 is the moment Joseph shows himself to his brothers and begins the whole thing of Jacob and the 70 or so uh, family members coming to Egypt. And uh, Pharaoh promises them he'll give them the best of Egypt. They're going to be in the land of Goshen. They're going to be close to where Joseph can take care of them. They were wealthy already, but when they came into Egypt, they became extremely wealthy. Really cool. And today we're in Exodus 12, which is the other bookend of Genesis 43. Because today, we're in a place where they're going to head out of Egypt. And eventually there came pharaohs that did not remember Joseph. For a long time, pharaohs remembered Joseph because Joseph had saved Egypt. But you know, dynasties change. And when dynasties change, new dynasties try to scrub the old dynasty and all the history and everything. And uh, so there comes a time when they don't remember Joseph and they begin to oppress uh, Israel. And uh, it becomes even more oppressive because they notice how large Israel is becoming and how strong Israel is becoming. And there even gets to be that place that they begin to kill the male children. And uh, that's when Moses comes along. And y'all remember that his, uh, his mom kept him in the house for a while till it became just too hard to keep him in the house without him being discovered. And they made an ark, an arky arky, <laughs> and put it in the muddy muddy, you know, <laughs> if you know that song. And, um, and Miriam, his older sister, is there watching to try to make sure everything goes according to plan. And I think, it doesn't actually say, but I think the plan was for Pharaoh's daughter to find him, that they put him in a strategic place. It's interesting that they put Moses in an ark in the place where the children were killed. The male children were thrown into the Nile to drown or to be eaten by the crocs or whatever, you know. But he was placed there in an ark to save him. And Pharaoh's daughter did find him when she came to bathe. And, and Miriam ran up immediately when it was obvious that uh, Pharaoh's daughter uh, was enamored by Moses. It says Moses was a beautiful child. And uh, Miriam offers to go get a wet nurse from the Hebrews. And you don't know how thinly veiled all that is. You know, I'm sure Pharaoh's daughter was very smart and may have immediately known the whole thing, but was just so enamored with the baby. Um, but then again, maybe the Lord, you know, kept it, kept him hidden somehow. 
She obviously knew it was a Hebrew child. How do you know that she knew it was a Hebrew child? So what? Wrapped in a blanket. Oh, okay. Had no idea that made a Hebrew child. Okay, wrapped in a blanket. Maybe with a star of David on it. Oh, David hadn't come yet. So. He was circumcised. That made him different. <laughs> he was circumcised. She knew he was Hebrew. She was not fooled. She knew he was, he was a Hebrew child that had been placed there to try to save him. And, and she, to her credit, she took him in. There are different accounts. We don't, we don't have really an account from Scripture. Uh, but there are different traditions about Moses growing up. Uh, there are some traditions that Moses grew up, obviously, as an heir to the throne of uh, her dad. And that he was, he was excellent in everything of the Egyptians. It, you know, he showed himself brighter showed himself more athletic, showed himself a greater leader, all of that kind of thing. And all of that probably is true because obviously the Lord had already chosen him to deliver, you know, and was in the process of saving him for that purpose. And meanwhile, he's being raised by his mom, you know, who's coming. Uh, in fact, they may have taken him into their home for a while and just brought him to the Pharaoh's daughter for visitation till, till he was weaned and then he would have gone to the palace to live. And maybe his mom would have continued to have access to him. So uh, probably his own mother taught him his heritage and taught him of God. And apparently in the midst of all the idolatry of Egypt, he served the Lord faithfully had a very clear idea of who he was. There's some tradition, I think uh, Josephus covers this maybe, if y'all know Flavius Josephus. And even though Josephus has a lot of accurate stuff, he, he will take liberties with things because of his audience. Because, for example, when, when Samson brings a bunch of foreskins, and I won't go any further with what a foreskin is, um, he changes it, because of the Romans he's dealing with, he changes it to like scalps or something, you know, something to, to change it a little bit, you know. And so he'll, he'll change things based on the fact that he's writing to Greek and Romans. So I'm not exactly sure how accurate this is, but I think it's Josephus that says, in court, they were jealous of Moses because they saw how bright he was and they knew he was a Hebrew. And they saw the favor that Pharaoh had for him. And they saw the protection of Pharaoh's daughter. And that they would constantly say to the Pharaoh, if you continue to promote him, he will end up destroying Egypt. They were prophesying. And, and there came a time, I know that Moses says at the burning bush that he's not powerful in uh, actions or speech or whatever. But it appears that he was general of the Egyptian armies and won a huge victory against Ethiopia and basically saved Egypt as a commander of the Egyptian armies. And uh, then obviously got to that place somewhere around 40. He's coming up on 40. He's very aware that he's supposed to deliver Israel out of Egyptian bondage and he sees an Egyptian beating up on a, on a Jewish guy and, and I don't think he meant to but he got in pulling the guy off he killed the guy and he buried him in shifting sands <laughs> time through the hourglass oh never mind and, um, and then the next day he sees two Jewish guys in a dispute and he goes up to try to get them to, you know, cease fire. And they said, what are you going to do? Kill us like you did that Egyptian yesterday? And then he was like, <laughs> I don't know if you can see me or not, but. <laughs> Gigs up. And even though he was next to Pharaoh, he would 
easily be executed for killing an Egyptian over a Hebrew slave. And so he decided to vamoose at 40. And we could go through the numbers, but obviously the Lord did not call him to deliver Israel in that way. And he probably cost Israel 30 years of bondage. Because God had told Abraham they'd be gone for 400 years. It was 430 years by the time they came out. Moses was gone for 40. So that means that the original plan was within 10 years of when Moses killed that man, they were going to be free. If Moses had just... Remember how I said Joseph did not try to do it in his own strength and go find his family. He waited on the timing of the Lord. Moses did not wait on the timing of the Lord. He tried to do it in his own strength. And it cost them. The Lord still used him, still delivered Israel, but 30 years. 30 years. I don't want to do 30 more years of bondage. I don't know about y'all. <laughs> So he goes off. He ends up with Jethro, priest of God, and uh, ends up being a uh, shepherd for him, marrying one of his daughters. It all came about when he ran a bunch of guys away because he was a warrior, and he took care of a bunch of guys that were picking on, on uh, the daughters. But anyhow, what was that, Jacob? It was probably both. They have similar stories there. So, so one day he sees this burning bush that's not being consumed. So now he's like knocking on 80. For 40 years, he had been the brightest star on earth because he was second in command by the time he got up to leaving Egypt to the most powerful civilization on earth. And then obscurity for 40 years. And as great as he had been in his youth, he became humble pie in that second 40 years. So when he told the Lord that he couldn't speak, lots of times you'll hear people go, oh yeah, Moses... He was a stutterer and all that kind of stuff. He was powerful in speech when he was in Egypt. If he was a stutterer at this point, it's because he couldn't imagine going back to Egypt. Made him nervous. <laughs> because it says he was powerful in speech earlier. So anyhow, they have this little thing. You know, God says, I am that I am. That's a really cool thing in there. Moses has to take his shoes off because it's holy ground. He has to throw his, his rod down, becomes a snake. The Lord says, pick it up. And he's like, I don't think so. You know, pick it up. So he picks it up, becomes a staff, all that kind of thing. And so he goes to Egypt. And you may not know this part. I won't spend any time on it. But God almost killed him on the way because he hadn't circumcised his kids. So there was a little thing with that and his wife calling him a bloody husband and stuff. I don't know if she was British or what, but <laughs> anyhow. So you got to get this. The most powerful, not just nation, but empire on earth. And Pharaoh, who's the most powerful king on earth, and who is seen by his people as a God. Minding their own business being great. And being powerful. And out of the wilderness comes an old man with a staff. An old man with a stick. And in fact. Because Moses makes such a big deal about he's a stutterer. And he can't really talk for the Lord. He sends his older brother, Aaron, out to meet him. So it's two old men, an 80-year-old and an 83-year-old, and one stick come walking up to the palace of the greatest king on earth. Can you see how absurd that must have been to Pharaoh? Now, Pharaoh 
in all likelihood, either knew Moses or knew of Moses. Not sure who the Pharaoh was at this point. But this is somebody who could have known Moses. He could have been young when Moses left. In the first three plagues, you know there were ten plagues, a complete judgment. The first three, the magicians of, uh, of Egypt duplicated. Well, didn't quite duplicate. Moses threw a staff down, it became a snake. They threw theirs down, it became snakes. Of course, Moses' stick ate their sticks. So not quite as good as Moses. When they did the, the first plague, which was turning the Nile and, and really water everywhere into blood, the magicians did that as well. They could not reverse it. Moses called for the end of it, and it stopped. They could not reverse it. All they could do is keep on bringing death. Hey, that's a word right there. The devil's never going to give you anything good. He'll get you, and he'll keep on giving you the nasty, horrible stuff. It's going to get worse and worse and worse and worse. I think the frogs were next. They were able to bring the frogs. They couldn't tell the frogs to go. They could only bring more frogs. Hip, hip, hooray! Frogs everywhere. Frogs galore. Some of you like frog legs. You'd have had your feel. Also, these first three things, the first three plagues hit Israel too. This is really important. Judgment begins in the house of God. We can't holler that we're protected and insulated and immune if we've got junk in our house that needs to be dealt with. Amen. But after the first three plagues, they were protected and immune. And Egypt experienced the rest, but not Israel. In fact, when it got to the one of darkness, darkness everywhere in Egypt, lights in Israel, not a problem. So, so there's all that going on, and it gets to this crescendo. Most of you, I think, know that each of these plagues is aiming at Egyptian gods. It's to show that Yahweh yes, is greater than every god of Egypt. And, and it's just the main gods, because they've got tons of gods. And some of the plagues is actually aiming at more than one god, you know? And so, so you go through, and, and it shows. And, and there's a time that, that Pharaoh acts like he's going to let them go. But if you look at Pharaoh, you can find the compromises of Pharaoh. Because Moses starts off, let my people go so they can worship. And he says, okay, you can go worship, but you stay in Egypt. No, Moses had said to leave Egypt to go to the wilderness to worship. So Pharaoh tries to compromise with God. You got to stay in Egypt. And then it becomes, after a while, it becomes, okay, you can go, but leave your children here. You can go, but leave your possessions, your herds here, or your flocks here. You know, he kept giving, he kept giving God a better idea. This disobedience is, is trying not to obey. And he had plenty of opportunity to obey, and he didn't. And it came to a place that it says that God hardened his heart. Because if I harden my heart, harden my heart, harden my heart, and I get to the place that my heart is never going to change, then the Lord will just add to it to show everybody else who will repent. Right? Right? So they finally get to where we are today, Exodus 12. So I'm going to read through this Exodus 12 and, um, and just talk briefly about it. And then I'll have some things about sort of the whole story that I'll mention because it's just, there's just such good stuff. Um, when you look at the Old Testament, I said this last week with Joseph, there are these pictures of Jesus 
And one of the wonderful things about Joseph is he's a pretty clean picture of Jesus. And there are lots of parallels to make Jesus really clear. Moses is another one. In fact, if you, if you choose probably the dominant figure of the Old Testament, it's Moses, the deliverer. And Jesus is going to come as a deliverer. One of the prophecies that Moses has about the Messiah is he will be a prophet like unto me. Jesus was a prophet like unto Moses, you know. When you look at the Mount of Transfiguration, Moses is one of the guys there with Jesus. And so Moses is dominant. He wrote the first five books of the Old Testament, the Pentateuch. He's, he's huge. So he's got 40 years in Egypt, 40 years as a shepherd, and then 40 years the process of delivering Israel into the land. Okay? So here we go. Pass over the door. What a cool picture. Pass over the door. I hate to even take it off that. That's so cool. And I can't take it off that because I don't know where the remote is. So... Uh, <laughs> So until I find the remote, oh, look at there. But I have found the remote, so there we go. All right. Thank you, Kevin. It's good to have son-in-laws, especially when their dad is sitting beside them. They're sort of caught in this two-way thing. Dad's there, and I'm up here, and so, ah, I will, I'll tell you, I do try to trick Kevin into saying something about Angie. I do. I try to get him to step into something. With that. And he doesn't. He doesn't. He doesn't. But I do. <laughs> I do try. I give him every opportunity to say the wrong thing, and he stays clean as a whistle. And that, I'll even get to the point that I'll lie to Angie. Kevin says so-and-so. <laughs> and Kevin hadn't even got to say anything. Angie goes, he did not. Because <laughs> she thinks I tell stories. <laughs> I don't know where that comes from. So this is Passover the door, Exodus 12, 23. In the Naz, the Naz, the New American Standard Bible. For the Lord will pass through to smite, I like that Old Testament word, smite the Egyptians. He's going to slap them. He's going to hit them. He's going to knock them out. And when he sees the blood on the lintel, lintel, and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to come into your houses to smite you. Because the destroyer is going to come in houses to smite people, but when there's blood on the doorpost and blood on the doorpost and blood on the lintel, he will not be able to get in. So everything on the inside is protected. Everything on the inside is sealed by the blood. And when the Lord is looking at, that's a good way, the worthiness To live or die, he does not look at your worthiness. He looks at the blood. Because we'd all be dead, right? And obviously, y'all are with it enough to know those lambs were substitutes. They're pictures of what the Lord's going to do through Jesus, right? So the blood of Jesus, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, the perfect Lamb. Well, let me just stop there and just go and let's read this text and see what it says. So, uh, 1221 of Exodus. Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go and take for yourselves lambs according to your families and slay the Passover lamb. You shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood which is in the basin and apply some of the blood that is in the basin to the lintel and the two doorposts 
and none of you shall go outside the door of his house until morning. He skips right to dipping hyssop into a basin. The part that you don't know is obviously they're going to slit the throat of the sacrifice, the lamb, and catch the blood in the basin. We know there's blood on the lintel, the horizontal part, and there's blood on the doorposts. And you can already see there's blood on Jesus, his head, and on his hands. Probably, we don't know for sure, but probably the lamb was slain at the threshold. And so the blood would have fallen on the threshold while they were putting it in the basin to take the hyssop. To, so the place of the feet as well, blood. Picture of the cross. The cross is everything to us. It's our salvation. Everything changes at the cross. History, you know how a door pivots on a hinge History pivots on the hinge of the cross. Changes everything. 12.23, our key scripture, for the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians, and when he sees the blood on the lintel and the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to come into your houses to smite you. Some of you may have listened to Dutch. He actually talked about that Hebrew word this this week, it means, it means to jump over, to leap over. It can also mean to dance. It can also mean to limp. You know, there comes, in fact, Dutch talked about it. There comes a time when Elijah says, how long are you going to limp between the two opinions? When you should be dancing the Passover dance, why are you limping because you're serving Baal and giving your children in human sacrifice? What's up with that? So one word can have different meanings depending on the context. There's even an Egyptian word that's very similar to it that basically means to be covered with the wings. Isn't that cool? 24 and 25, and you shall observe this event as an ordinance for you and your children forever. When you enter the land which the Lord will give you as he has promised, you shall observe this right. Isn't that cool that the Lord, he hasn't taken them out of bondage yet. And he's already reminding them, I've got land for you. I've already promised to give you this land. It's sitting over there waiting for you. That's where we're heading. You've got an inheritance. You've done nothing to earn it. It's because I made an agreement with Abraham and you just happened to be kin to him. Isn't that cool? Yeah. He made an agreement with Jesus, and now we're kin to him. I like that. 26 and 27, and when your children say to you, what does this right mean to you? You shall say, it's a Passover sacrifice to the Lord who passed over the houses of the sons of Israel in Egypt when he smote, (laughs) I just like to say it, smote the Egyptians but spared our home. Would you like to be smitten or spared? Some some people talk about being smitten with love. (laughs) Might not mind being smitten with chocolate. (laughs) Valentine's Day, something, but. He smote the Egyptians, but he spared Israel. And the people bowed low and worshiped. Verse 28, Then the sons of Israel went and did so, just as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron, so they did. In other words, they chose a lamb. So check this out. In fact, you may be able to find this in your text there. It depends on the translation. But it starts off saying, choose a lamb. Choose a lamb. (laughs) In other words, there's lots of lambs. There are flocks. Choose a lamb. 
Then that lamb goes into your house and you examine it for four days. Remember Jesus in the temple before the crucifixion? He was being examined by the house because he was the Passover lamb. He was being found without spot or wrinkle or blemish. An acceptable Passover lamb comes into your house. You treat this lamb like a member of your family. The next time it mentions the lamb, it says the lamb because it's not just a lamb. Now you've chosen. Now you've got this lamb in your house, the lamb. The lamb you've chosen that's in your house. And then by the time it gets to the time to slay it, it's your lamb. It belongs to you. You've got a relationship with this lamb. This lamb has been in your house and your children are fond of this lamb. They've given this lamb a name. No, daddy, don't kill Ralph. (laughs) Right? You feel it when you kill the Passover lamb. He's your lamb and he's taking away your sin. Well, he's sealing you in to keep you from the destroyer. And so they did it. Did what what Moses and Aaron had said. Verse 29. Now it came about at midnight that the Lord struck all the firstborn in the land of Egypt. At midnight, from the firstborn of Pharaoh, who sat on his throne, to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon. And all the firstborn of the cattle. Now, I don't know for sure, but my guess there is, that's another little thing of those cows aren't holy. Right? I don't know why it's not every animal. It just mentions the cattle. Maybe it was every animal and it just mentions the cattle. I don't know. But firstborn... From the captive in the dungeon all the way up to Pharaoh on the throne and the firstborn of the cattle. Verse 30, Pharaoh arose in the night, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt for there was no home where there was not someone dead. And I don't know where this stopped. I'm an eldest child. I'm not a young child, but I'm the firstborn. Did the old people die too if they were the firstborn? Then you could see very quickly how there wouldn't be anywhere that wasn't touched by this in Egypt. Thirty-one and thirty-two. This is interesting. Then he called for Moses and Aaron at night and said. Let me just pause there before, before I continue with what he said. The last thing he had said to Moses and Aaron was, get out of my sight and never come in front of me again. His tune changed, right? Get out of my sight, never appear before me ever again. And then suddenly, I need Moses and Aaron, right? And he summons them. He says, rise out, rise out, rise up. I'm sort of reading ahead here. Rise up, get out from among my people, both you and the sons of Israel. Go worship the Lord as you have said. Take both your flocks and your herds as you have said and go and bless me also. Look, he's basically saying, go do what you asked me to do to start with. He's not trying to put any requirements on it now. You... You go and do like you said to start with. And while you're at it, bless me before you go. Two old men with a stick rule the deity Pharaoh of the greatest civilization on earth. Two old guys with a stick. Don't be messing with them old World War II veterans liable to hit you with our hickory cane. (laughs) We'll skip to verse 35. Now the sons of Israel had done according to the word of Moses, for they had requested, the Lord had told them to request from the Egyptian 
articles of silver and articles of gold and clothing. The Lord told him, hey, while you're at it, go ahead and just like ask everybody for all their stuff. <laughs> right? This is before all this happened. You know, go ahead and ask everybody for all the stuff. And look, imagine this, verse 36. And the Lord had given the people favor in sight of the Egyptians. The Egyptians, long before Pharaoh said, go do it, the Egyptians had been going like, y'all need to go. Y'all need, need to leave here. The Egyptians were convinced way earlier, right? So that they let them have their request. Thus, they plundered. Some of your versions say spoiled the Egyptians. That's like a battle. That's like you have a battle, you win the battle, and you pick up the spoils. There was a, there was a word here in the house involved pirates a few years ago, and it was like pick up the booty. There's some treasures. They left. And I've heard people say, and it's not that it's not true, but they left. Some people will say, with all the wages they were owed for all the oppression and bondage. I think it's more than that. Because they came into Egypt wealthy. And when they got to Egypt, Pharaoh and Joseph made them really wealthy. And so I don't think it's just back pay. I think it's restoring their stuff to them that was theirs in the beginning along with back pay. So they walked out of Egypt with all the stuff that was precious. And it was theirs. Check this out. Some of you have been believing for a wealth transfer. You've been going to meetings for years. There is coming a day the wealth of the wicked is laid in store for the righteous. And people jumping up and down. May it be today. The wealth of the wicked laid in store for the righteous. And to tell you the truth, the righteous weren't all that righteous. They were covered by the blood. They were covered by the blood. There's not a lot of righteousness and worthiness within themselves. They've just been sealed by the blood. The grace of God is doing a mighty work because of a promise to Abraham. Because... He's not a man that he should lie. He is the great promise keeper. You got a promise from the Lord? Hold on to it. Hold on to it. Hold on to it. So I think, I think that's, that's all of those. But I do want to say a few things. Okay, so we'll get that off. And I may have said some of this along the way, but not all of it. Because it's too much. Too much. But I will tell you this. Because some of you really like to go do extra credit. Have at it. Here are three important Passovers. This one, Exodus 12, is the Passover of salvation. The Passover of salvation. It's when you're born again. It's when you step into the 30-fold. The blood's been applied, right? In Joshua chapter 5, there's a Passover of conquest. A Passover of conquest. Joshua 5. Joshua 5 is where he comes up on Jesus, who's also Joshua. And he says, are you first or again us? And Jesus says, I'm doing my own thing. You get in line. Right? The Passover of conquest in Joshua 5 is parallel to being spirit-filled and stepping into 60-fold. 
Don't have time to unpack this stuff. I'm just giving it to you for fun. Okay? Luke 22. That's the other testament, right? Jesus is here. Luke 22 is the Passover of the kingdom. The king has come. Right? Came into Jerusalem. The king has come. And it's the mature man. The mature man. It's, it's the king making us royal priests and us stepping into the hundredfold. You like that? Three Passovers. Now, there are other Passovers that are mentioned in Scripture. Exodus 12, the first one. Joshua 5, taking the land. And then Luke 22, taking the kingdom. Here's some stuff in Exodus 12. I mentioned the basin. The lamb was killed at the door. There's a huge step before you cross the threshold. Are you willing to be obedient? Are you willing to take the Passover lamb? Are you willing to be covered by the blood? That's a huge step. Many people get to the threshold and never cross over. Hyssop. You use hyssop to put the blood on the lintel and the door frames, the doorposts on the door frames. Jesus was offered sour wine on a hyssop branch. Hadn't got time to play with that. Cool stuff. Egypt was spoiled. That means Egypt was stripped. Israel was clothed. Israel was resourced. Israel was equipped. The mightiest nation on earth was bankrupt and stripped. And in a moment, the people of God walked out free when they had been in bondage right before they left. It's for us today. It calls it a memorial. It calls Passover a memorial. Jesus calls the Lord's Supper a memorial. Do this to remember. Right? Yes. We mentioned this already. When the Lord looks at Danny, he doesn't see Danny. He sees the blood. Yes. Yes. Danny is, the verdict is given that Danny is righteous, not because of the righteousness of Danny, but because of the blood that covers Danny. Amen. It's all about the blood. They ate ready to leave. Remember, they had their cloaks tucked in their belts. They had their sticks and they had their shoes on because the Lord's going to do a quick work. He's going to do a mighty work, a complete work, a quick work. Before you even get the thing eaten good, you're free. Hey. Yes, Jesus. Yes. We need to have that expectation. When we have communion in the next moment or so, we need to remember when we eat this, Freedom is coming. Breakthrough is coming. And it's coming in haste. But if I don't believe it and I don't expect it, I'm not ready for it. Protection and immunity is mine. Angels of protection have been assigned to me because of my relationship with the king, the Lord of hosts. (laughs) Jesus is the perfect lamb, and there's a lamb for a house. Jesus is the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world because he's the lamb of God for his father's house. And so everybody that wants to become a child of God, there's enough of this lamb to go around to become a member of father's household. He's more than enough already mentioned about he's chosen four days earlier and that's you know the triumphant entry and then he's tested on the temple mount for four days before the crucifixion already mentioned a lamb the lamb your lamb I I sort of touched on this but 
Not only was Egypt idolatrous with a whole slew of gods, because the Israelites had been there all that time, so were they. In fact, when, the God, when God starts moving, you know who they cry out to? Pharaoh. Pharaoh. The Lord is in their midst about to deliver them and they're crying out to Pharaoh for help against two old guys with a stick. Backed up by the Lord God Almighty. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and here's a good one. I'm sorry. It was a good one and I didn't I didn't say it yet because my eyes fell on the next one and I was like, what is that about? I don't remember what that is. <laughs> so, so he changed the calendar. Do you know that? He changed the calendar. First month is in the fall. In fact, y'all see this. It gets confusing, the Hebrew calendar. And we say, well, this is, this is Rosh Hashanah and it's the first of the new year, the civil calendar. But the first of the religious calendar is when you get to Passover in the spring. He changed the calendar and calls these months the first months because nothing matters till you get saved and free. What happened before is just bondage and tribulation. But the moment you step into Jesus, new day, new calendar, new life. Isn't that cool? Now, what's, what's the three players on House of God, too? What is that three players? Three pl I can't read my writing. Three players. Angie, will you come? Three plagues. Okay, I did that. The first three plagues were on the House of God, too. Okay, and here's what I'm going to end with, because Angie really liked it. I did, a, I did that video post on the seven eye wheels. I was debating whether to include it or not, but Angie was like, I really, I really like those seven eye wheels. So, okay. Yes, you will. Because every time she sees a double number, she says, yes, you will, God. And somebody this week said, you need to tell God what he will do. And she said, these are perfect for telling God what he will do. Chapter yep, chapter six. If you want to go there, I'm going to have the Amplified, which gives me a handicap. <laughs> that was for Dolores and Grace who probably have the passion today or something. But this is uh, 6 through 8 of Exodus chapter 6. Check these I wills out. Verse 6. Accordingly, say to the Israelites, I am the Lord. That's like a signature. That's what he's doing is he's signing off on this. Tell them I'm the Lord. In other words, this is, these things are coming from me. I am the Lord. I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. Y'all can say it. Number one. Right? I will free you from their bondage. I will receive you with an outstretched arm with special and vigorous action and by mighty acts of judgment. That was a long one because it's the Amplified. I will take you to me for a people. Number four. four. I will be to you a God. Five. This is sort of throwing a little curve because it says, and you shall know that it is I, the Lord, your God, who brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. So that's sort of a wrinkle in there. I will bring you into the land concerning which I lifted up my hand and swore that I would give it to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Six. Six. I will give it to you for a heritage. Seven. Seven I wills. And he started off by saying, I am the Lord. Tell the Israelites, I am the Lord. Yahweh, I am that I am. And check this out. After he does those seven I wills, he says, I am am the Lord. Yes. I am the Lord. You have the pledge of my changeless omnipotence and faithfulness. Because it's the Amplified. They got to say all that. All right. Isn't that cool? Yes. 
There are things the Lord has promised. There are things the Lord wants to do. But we got to agree. And we got to expect. Right? Right. Praise team can go ahead and come up. What a cool, cool thing. Passover, right here, knocking on the door. I like that. Knocking on the door of Passover. Look at y'all coming. Young, young, young. Young. Amen. Youth renewal in Jesus' name. I need her young, Lord. I'm selfishly saying, I need Dolores Young. I'm not saying for her to marry a guy named Young, Lord. I want to be very clear. I'm saying I need her young. Young. Yes. Everybody saved? Everybody saved. Everybody's good. Everybody's sealed by the blood. Okay, where well, we're going to, uh, to pray concerning the Lord's Supper. If you need to leave after the Lord's Supper, just take off, be blessed. If you need prayer, the prayer room's right over there. You can go get prayer in the prayer room. If you'd like to continue worshiping, they'll, they'll be up here leading worship for, for a bit. Good? Here we go. So, Lord, we thank you for this memorial, and we remember what you've done for us. You were crushed and bruised for our iniquity, our inside sin that can't be seen. And you were wounded for our transgression, the things that can be seen from the outside. The chastisement of our peace was on you. You're the Prince of Peace, and you took our chastisement, our punishment, so that your peace could come to us. And by your stripes, we were healed. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for healing us. We just give you praise for healing us. Thank you for healing us. It's already done. We thank you for it. And so we eat this bread and we remember your body. And we drink from this cup and we remember your blood. We thank you that you have redeemed us and you have made us new. All things are new and old things have passed away. You've changed the calendar from the time we were born again. And everything is now ticking. The life of salvation. The life of life abundant. The life of forevermore. Thank you, Lord. Meet with us as we eat and drink. Give us revelation. And we pray all this in your name, Jesus. Amen.